Hello, Pastor Brad here from Emmanuel Baptist in Columbus. We're glad to have you with us this morning. We are studying the book of Revelation. If you've not joined us up to this point, uh, we have seen Jesus Christ come on the scene in chapter 1, introduce himself, reveal himself as, as King of kings, Lord of lords, ascended God in glory with the right hand of the Father, and sovereign in control, present among his church. Chapters 2 and 3, we see Jesus Christ ministering to his church. The church of the day in John's time is John's writing this letter, the inspired word of God, and yet the church today as well, the church age, which we are a part of. And then we see chapters 4 and 5, we see Jesus Christ, we see God the Father in heaven in all their glory, the question being answered, who is worthy to, to unveil and to unfold and to, and to do all the things that are about to happen in Revelation? The answer is only God, Jesus Christ, because he gave his life for us. He loved us so much. He is holy. He is divine. Chapter 6 reveals then the beginning of judgment. The rapture has occurred. The church has been lifted up. And now the judgments of God begin on this earth. It started with the seal judgments. And we finished that up today. We're in chapter 8. And so what we saw last week in chapter 7 was a reminder, the last two weeks, that God is, is setting aside a group, the 144,000 Jews from Israel, believed biblically those are literal Jews. They will be a, 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 a light to the world. They will be a, a gospel witness, a testimony, proclaiming the gospel to a world who needs to hear. The result of that in chapter 7 is multitudes from the world, from every tribe, language, tongue, people group, will receive Jesus Christ as Savior. The gospel revival, the gospel proclamation is going to be worldwide. It will be a revival like this world has never seen. In the midst of that is this wrath of God that we see. And so we have a movement today in chapter 8 from the seal judgments to the trumpet judgments. Again, for you and I who are living here before the rapture occurs, we're not going to go through these times of judgment. We're not going to go through the tribulation. I believe the Word of God teaches us that. We've, we've shown that and looked at that. At the same time, it's, it's meant to impact how you live for Jesus Christ, how I live for Jesus Christ. It's to give us a view that people need the Lord, that God is a God of grace even in the midst of, of wrath, that God, until we take our last breath, is giving every man, every woman, every child an opportunity to receive grace, to receive and step into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going to see that here today and in Revelation, how important that is. May God just touch your heart, move your heart, uh, that those people in your life and my life who, who don't know the Lord yet, they need the Lord before it's too late. And so we step into this. Chapter, chapter 8 is where we begin. And uh, that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So let's look at that. The first thing that we see is the last of the, of the seven seals. It is the seventh seal, verse 1. And when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. There has been, there has been nothing but, but loud praise and, and worship and adoration uh, before the throne from chapter 4 all the way to this moment. Heaven has just been has been a buzz with uh, worship and adoration and praise. The angels, the multitudes, the four living creatures, the twenty-four elders, um, the martyrs. Heaven has just been has just been um, worshiping Jesus Christ, worship, worshiping God the Father. All that's been taking place nonstop, and now as the seventh seal is opened, heaven goes silent. For a half an hour, it says that heaven is silent. It doesn't tell us why heaven is silent, but we can we can surmise. Um, you know, as that seventh seal is open, the scroll that has the seven seals, now the scroll is fully open. Are those participants who are there able to see the, the full scroll now, the, both sides? And if they do, can they even understand what they see because it hasn't happened yet? There certainly is a sense of the of the holiness of God, the, the, the awesomeness of God. There's a sense of... of um, of anticipation about what's to come. There's a grim reality about the judgment that's about to be thrown down upon the earth. Um, there's, there's, there's a sense that, that this moment is of, of utmost importance. The gravity of the situation, the, the, uh, the fact that, that sin is, is being specifically judged on the earth. And God in His holiness is the only one who can do it. All this just, just lends itself to a moment where nobody, nobody can talk. Nobody is able to talk. Nobody is able to verbalize. No one's able. Everything stops. And God in His sovereignty just allows all of those participants to, to, just, to just stop, 
to focus, um, to consider what all is going on in their minds, we don't know. But there is a gravity to the situation. There is a seriousness to the situation. Our sin is serious. Our relationship with God before God is, is serious. What He's about to do is, is bring the culmination of judgment that He's promised upon the earth, upon sin. And there's a moment of pause before He does. A moment of reverence. Ze- Zephaniah gives us a picture of this, the lull before the storm. Be silent before the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and has consecrated His guests. He is holy. He has been that sacrifice. He's prepared a sacrifice. He has prepared judgment to come down. He have a holy God here. The, the, the earth, the, the world falls silent before Him, as it were. Here in heaven, heaven falls silent before Him. It's like, it's like the hurricane where we've had those first six seals come through and there's... A, and there's now quiet. There's already been devastation on the earth. There's more to come. And there's that moment of introspection. Uh, there's that moment of meditation. There's that moment of calm before the rest comes. That's what's taking place here. Judgment surely is to come. There's an emphasis on the holiness of God, Habakkuk. But the Lord is in His, His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before Him. It, the holiness of God clearly is on display here as it has been. And it, and it causes a somber quietness in heaven. You know, as I read through and look through, and we move through Revelation, I'm always thinking, what, is this, what does this mean for us? How does, it touch, how does it touch my life right here, right now? How does it touch the life of a believer? How does it touch our lives? It's not just information. It's not just facts. It's not just a timetable. It's not just eschatology. It's real. It's people being affected by their relationship or lack of relationship to God. Psalm 46 reminds us that we're to be still before God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. You know, we, we are called to be still before God, to take time to, to simply contemplate who God is, to contemplate His Word and the impact of His Word on our life, to contemplate what the Spirit of God might be speaking into my life, what He might be calling me to do, what God is striving and trying to do in my life, what His will, His plan is for me. We, we, we need to practice more and exercise more the art of being silent before God, of listening to God's heart. And in listening, be, uh, develop a perspective and awareness of the presence of God in our life and of what that means. Because we don't slow down, because we don't meditate before the Lord, because we're not silent before Him, we don't often hear His voice. We don't often discern His path, His will, because we're too busy running ahead of God. We're too busy maybe doing our own things. And this is a call and a reminder to us that God re- reminds every believer we're to, we're to have we're to be silent before Him. It's going to be part of the practice of the believer. When we pray in meditation, and we're we're practicing this. When we take the Word and we just let it soak into our mind, into our heart, and contemplate and meditate on His Word, there's a there's an element of silence that's taking place, very needful, so that we can hear ultimately the voice of God, what He's trying to say to us. What is God trying to say to you, to me? What is it that's taking place? So there's a moment of silence. And then we come to verse 2, and John continues, And then I saw seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. We have, we have seven trumpets here to come on the scene. Um, God is God. When you see trumpets in the Scripture, you see them used. They were, they were a significant part of the nation of Israel. When, when God called, when the people were called together, um, like the anointing of a king or something like that. Trumpets were used when they were called to war. When there was a celebration after war, there was a calling together, the conquest of Jericho, it comes into mind. Uh, when there were special special occasions, God God's people were called together at the blast of the trumpet. They were to call God's people together. They would get the attention of God's people. At Mount Sinai, they were called together. The trumpet blasts were, were there. When and here in Revelation in chapter one verse fifteen, when John heard the Lord's voice, it sounded like a trumpet. It got his attention. Chapter four verse one, when 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 God begins to show him the, what's going to happen in the future and that heavenly scene, he is summoned to heaven with a trumpet blast. The trumpet blast is always intended to get our attention. The trumpet blast, the trumpet judgments are are intended to get the attention of a world who won't listen. How do you get someone's attention when they don't listen? This is what God does. This is what God does. 
And so it's God's, it's God's final wake-up call to humanity. And then the bold judgments will come and the wrath of God will be poured out in fullness on the earth. It is a final wake-up call. It's a prelude to more is coming. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the earth, of the land, tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. We are in the day of the Lord now. It is here. The trumpet blast announces that. announces more is to come. You think this was bad. It's going to get worse. You need to change your relationship with me. God is always speaking into your life, into my life. He's always calling us to change. He's calling to the believer to, to conform to the character of Christ. He's calling the unbeliever to, to respond to him in faith and to receive Christ, to change that relationship, one of, who is alienated to one who is a child of God, protected by the love of Christ. You also see here uh, in this chapter, as we move forward, we see another angel come on the scene, verses 3 through 5. And another angel came. There's seven angels. And by the way, we don't know who the seven angels are. Tradition tries to name them. They, are, they seem to be very uh, special angels, high in the order of angels, maybe at the highest. Gabriel, Michael, others. Uh, they are there to serve God in every capacity. But we don't know who they are, but they appear to be a, 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 a set of angels that are that are uniquely serving Jesus Christ. And then verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. And then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder and rumblings and flashings of lightning and an earthquake. The first thing that we see here is another angel. And the question is, who is this angel? We don't know for sure, but let's let's say that let's let's look at it. The first the first response that some have is that this is Jesus Christ. And they go back into the Old Testament with um, multiple occasions. Moses at the burning bush, where we have an angel of the Lord, which is Jesus Christ. Um, a Christophany, okay, Jesus Christ appearing in the flesh in the Old Testament before Moses. Um, and we see, um, not in the flesh as he was in the New Testament, but appearing in visible form. And so we see the angel of the Lord uh, in the Old Testament. Some see Jesus as the angel here in Revelation in chapter 10, verse 1, chapter 14, verse 14. We'll look at those when we get there. I don't think those are referring to Jesus Christ. Some believe that they are. Um, some would say the angel in the scriptures can't perform a priestly role. We see that the angel doing that here. So some that say this is Jesus Christ. He brings them before the Father. That's possible, but I don't think that's the answer. I think it's simply I think it's simply another angel. It says here, it says here in verse three, and another angel. The word for another, there's two in the Greek that could be used. The first is heteros, which means another of a different kind, another another of a distinct kind. This one means, um, this word that is used is alas, is another of the same kind. And so this, so the Greek tells us that this angel is another of the same kind, another of the same kind of the seven angels. That's really significant. And so it tells us, I believe, in context and from the language, that the angel here is not Christ. It is simply another angel that comes on the scene. Um, and so he performs, he's, he's not a priest, but he serves the Lord in that role. The, the Old Testament priest would, would serve the Lord, but the mediator ultimately is Jesus Christ. We see that, we see that here. First um, Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there's only one mediator between God and man. Uh, the priests ulti ultimately brought the people to the Lord and laid their sacrifices before God, but it was, it was on behalf of Jesus Christ, who is our mediator. The angels bring these before the Lord on behalf of Jesus Christ, who is our mediator. The key is that Jesus Christ is our mediator, not anyone else. Not the priests, not, not the angels. They may function in a role, but they are not the mediator. Only God is that. Only, Jesus Christ is only the one to whom we pray. He is only the one who has the power to mediate uh, between us and the Father, to bring spiritual significance between us and the Father. There is one mediator, there is one God between God and man, that's Jesus Christ. We have the incense here as well. So the angel comes, says, and he, and he stands at the altar with a golden censer, 
and he's given much incense to offer with the prayers of the saints. And so uh, he takes he takes that that uh, that censer, and so that that is that is uh, to use. It pictures the Old Testament tabernacle temple, where the altar of sacrifice was in the main out in the main court, and sacrifices were made, and then and then the coals from the, from those sacrifices were brought in to the the altar of the incense, and and then it was used to light that incense so that so that prayers holy prayers could be lifted up to God and here we see in we see in the heavenly scene that that altar of sacrifice and the altar of seven of incense and the holy of holies is one and the same in here in the temple in heaven and so both are being performed and that altar of sacrifice simply is a reminder to us that Jesus Christ he ultimately was the perfect sacrifice he fulfilled the sacrifice that was called for here in the Old Testament in his own body on the cross and so that sacrifice was perfected in Jesus Christ, and now it's lifted up, and 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 the result of that is it is it lifts up and, and brings up before His heavenly Father the prayers of the saints, the 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 cries of the saints of God, and it and and it and it shows us the favor of the Father on the children of God because of the work of Jesus Christ at that altar, and so we have a we have a scene here where everything that happens is based upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it's based upon the favor of God. And the prayers, the prayers of God's people are lifted up to the Father. And the prayers are a very significant part of what's going on here. Uh, what is happening next will be in response to the prayers of God's people. Prayer is so significant, so important. So the, so the angel is facilitating and moving those prayers before God. And God, it is the prayers of God's people, God's people. And it is God who is responding, God who is mediating, God who is doing the work not the angel. The angel is simply the messenger. He's simply the one who's moving that material. Exodus chapter 30. Prayer is a daily experience. As we looked in the Old Testament at the temple, Aaron would lift up that incense and burn that incense every morning and every evening, which were the prayers of the people. And as, as he did, the, prayer, the people would gather and they would pray. And the God, God calls us to pray. He calls to, us to pray to him faithfully. And that's what's happening here are the prayers of the saints. Psalm 141 verse 2. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you. And the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. That lifting up of the hands is, is yielding before God. It's humbleness before God. It's saying, Lord, I'm, I'm yours. I belong to you. When I pray, I'm saying, Lord, I depend on you. Lord, I, I yield to you. And that's exactly what's taking place here. Prayer is relationship. Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers... So we have confidence to enter a, a holy place. That's what's taking place here. By the blood of Jesus Christ, that's those coals, the work of Jesus Christ, as we draw near with a true heart, by faith, full assurance of faith, and because we're clean before the Lord. All these things are being fulfilled in, represented here in chapter 8. The reality of what's happening in, this, in these verses is the reality of God's Word. Children of God coming to God on the basis of the work of Jesus Christ, gaining the favor of God because of Jesus Christ in our life. Prayer is waiting. It is waiting how we have waited. For Revelation 6.10, the martyrs here in, in this verse, how long, God, before you bring uh, vengeance down upon the earth, before you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth, earth dwellers, heaven, earth. We see that. Prayer is the vehicle. Prayer we see here in chapter 5, we see here in chapter 8, is, is kept by God. Folks, it is, it is precious. When you and I pray, it is precious. When he had taken the scroll, Jesus, they had the four living creatures, the 24 elders. They fall down before the Lamb. They're holding a harp, and they're holding golden bowls full of incense. And that's the prayers of the saints. Not just martyred saints. That's all the saints, I believe, of all time. As we prayed and lifted up to him, you have a mix of people here in heaven. You have the church, and you have the you have the martyrs, and and there's there's a multitude of peoples that are here. And as we have prayed and lifted up our cries to God, boy, in some way He has He has kept those prayers before Him. And um, that is how precious it is when we pray to Him. We pray to Him in, in spirit and in truth. When we come to Him with authenticity and with honesty, not when we just pray for selfish reasons and for things that we want and, and pray to get what we want. But when we pray the will of God into our life, we pray on behalf of the will of God. We pray the character of Christ into our life. We pray for others 
to, to be saved. We pray for God's work to be accomplished and be done. Those things are collected. Those things are stored. And God answers those now. God answers those in the future. They are precious. They are kept. They are, they are a sweet aroma to the Lord. How important that is. And so we are to reflect God. We're to do that personally. We're to abide in Him. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, pray. Ask what you wish and it will be given, done for you. That's, that's His promise to us. When we pray, this is what we're doing. This is the reflection. When we pray and it is collected by God, it's, it's, it's done so because here's what's being reflected in our prayers when we pray. Number one, I am at home in the very presence of God. And number two, the words of God, they are at home in my life. When we pray, that's what we're acknowledging. We're saying, we're saying God, as I abide in you, I am at home with you which means I'm comfortable in, in the presence of your righteousness, in the presence of your holiness. I'm comfortable with, with being in your presence, knowing what you expect of my life. That's what I want. And so I pray to you because you are the one who can accomplish those things in my life. You are the one who helps me because I'm weak to have the strength to carry out your will in my life. And Lord, I am at home with your word and its desire for my life and what you desire to accomplish in my life through your word. And so your word is an integral part of my life. And when we pray, these things are being reflected. That we have made this conscious choice. We have made this relational choice before God. That's how important that is. And so praying is significant. Praying is reflection. I was just challenged this week because I was with a group of pastors. And one of the pastors spoke on prayer. And he asked this question. This is a good question to ask us this morning as we're here together. If God answered your, if, if your life today reflected the prayers that you prayed yesterday, would your life be any different? Would my life be any different? What are we praying? What are we asking God to do in our world, in the lives of those around us, in our own life? What are we asking God to do? If he answered that, would there be significant change in my life, my life, your life, in our church, in our community, in our neighborhood? And, and what would the result of that prayer be in our life? Prayer is significantly happening here. They are precious to the Lord. It is as a response to prayer that judgment starts. Okay? It's important. And so judgment now re-begins. The seal, seventh seal, now moves into the seven trumpets. So verse 5, we see that. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth. There were peals of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. There was an earthquake. The sacrifice is represented in those coals that are brought. When I reject the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I then face the judgment of God. That's what's happening here. And so as those, as those coals are taken out and they're released upon the earth, that righteous judgment of God is released on the earth. Vivid imagery here. And, and so we have, we have, again, descriptions of the holiness of God being poured on the earth. And then it says not only that, we have a literal earthquake. And there is an earthquake. Another earthquake on earth. Worldwide, yeah, quite potentially. An earthquake significant happens as well before the trumpets even begin. We have a holy God. Can never forget that. At Mount Sinai, Israel encountered God. Thunder, lightning, a loud trumpet blast, all these things that we see here. People in the camp, they trembled before God. They stood at the foot of the mountain. The Lord had descended upon it with fire. It was wrapped in smoke. The whole mountain trembled. And the, and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. And then Moses spoke, and God answered in thunder. Here we just see the, the, the awesome holiness of God. God's people knew it. They trembled. And they pled with Moses for God to speak to Moses, not directly to them, because they were terrified of the holiness of God. Ezekiel chapter 2, we see, we see a holy God leaving Jerusalem, the judgment of God. He said, fill your hands with burning coals, from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. That's imagery of God's judgment on Jerusalem. He would remove his glory from Israel, from judgment, from, uh, from Jerusalem. That's exactly what he does here in this passage. Revelation 4, 5 again. God is worthy and he's holy. From the throne, that's his holiness. That's his worthiness. Came lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. His holiness and his judgment are mixed together in Revelation. But they are in the word of God. He says to all of us over and over again, obey and you will receive blessing. Disobey and you will receive consequence. And that is mixed together throughout the Word of God. And so for you and I, there's just a reminder that there is a final judgment that's coming. It's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. See, worse 
worse than the judgments that's coming here on the earth is the judgment that will happen after that where we stand before the Lord. What unbeliever stands before the Lord, separated for all eternity. Folks, that's worse. I... If an, if an individual goes through this time of tribulation and, and dies because of the judgment of God, then they will face a greater judgment after they die at the great white throne when they will be separated from God for all eternity. Folks, you, need, you, need, you and I, we, we, need to, we need to understand what that means and, and pray that God just burdens our heart for people who need the Lord. Let's look at the trumpets, okay? First four trumpets. There are seven of them. The first four are is devastation on the earth. It is. It is affects the creation of His earth. We're going to see that. It's reminiscent of the ten plagues that God used to to deliver Israel from Egypt. It's not a perfect match. It's not meant to be, but it reveals that as God acted on behalf of Israel in the Old Testament, He is now acting on behalf of His people here on earth in the New Testament in the tribulation. We see. We see parallels. We certainly see similarities. What God was able to do then, He's able to do now. Many believe that that uh, those things were symbolic. If I, if I come to the Word of God and I see God's miracles as symbols and I explain them away, then I have no reason to approach Revelation that's not going to be consistent with that. I, we, are to, we are to take God's Word at His Word, literal, to believe, take it at face value, and here we see God literally dealing with earth. Let's look at the first judgment, the first trumpet, okay? Verse 6 and 7. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and those were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. We see the reality here, this hail, fire, blood. Remember remember earlier in, in verse 5, there's, a, there's a, another great earthquake. You know, the question is, when you read Revelation, is God is John trying to describe natural phenomena that's taking place? Is John trying to describe um, military conflict and warfare and nuclear activity and climate change and all those kind of things? Is John describing the literal handiwork of God? That's where I'm at. It could be these things. John could be trying to describe some of these things, but here's let's make this very clear. Whatever is happening here, it is, it is the work of God, the handiwork of God, the judgment of God. He may use and allow man to accomplish some of this. It may reflect some elements of warfare, for sure. It could. Or it simply may be the reality that God is literally casting judgment on the earth just like he did in Egypt. God is doing exactly what he said he would do here. That's where I'm at, ultimately. Hail, fire, blood. Do you have that huge earthquake? And it, and it spews all that stuff into the earth, then, then it brings, it, hail can come down, fire can back, come back down from the sky as volcanoes erupt and all these things happen because of earthquakes. The, it, it, there appears to be, to be uh, blood and all those kind of things. Uh, in the sky, the colors change red, the, the, the elements get into the air, poison the air, all that kind of stuff. But what we know here for sure is that God is judging the earth. And he's pouring down wrath upon the earth and it's having impact on the earth. The impact is this. A third of the earth, a third of the trees, and a third of the grass are burned up. That's specific. That's real. The result of whatever the judgment is, is that, is that by design, God destroys a third of the earth, its, veg its vegetation. That's what happens. That's the result. That's the impact. Folks, that's life changing on this earth. It changes everything. Uh, crops, oxygen, smoke in the air, the ability to breathe. It changes all of that. Folks, you want to talk about climate change, this is climate change. It changes it all. And now people are struggling to survive, period. It's because of the specific wrath of God that we see here. How significant. Now we're going to see grass later, and some say, well, this isn't what it means because we see grass later. See, grass regrows, vegetation regrows. Significant here what God does. Second trumpet, verse 8 and 9. The second angel blew his trumpet. Something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now it's important to see here, John uses a description, something like a mountain. And it was on fire, it was thrown into the sea. It doesn't say a mountain was thrown into the sea. Something like a mountain. Well, we would, we would see that. Okay, because he says like, so he's trying to describe something, put it into terms that we understand. 
That, that very easily is simply nothing more than simply a huge meteor uh, coming down to earth, impacting the earth in the hands of God, under the power of God, for the purpose of judgment upon the earth. It's, it's not difficult at all to see that reality. God is judging the earth. Often in our, in our uh, apocalyptic movies, the end times, it is a meteor that brings an end to the earth. God is going to use the celestial bodies, we've already seen that, to impact the earth, to be a, 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 a part of his judgment. That very much is what take, very likely would take us place, takes place right here. It's thrown into the sea. It affects, it affects the seas. A third of the sea turns into blood. Literal. Folks, if he does it in Egypt, he can do it here. Uh, it changes the sea. In some way, shape, or form, it changes everything. All, all, the, all the death that takes place. One third of the sea creatures died. That's blood everywhere. Uh, one third of the ships died. That's, that's people being, being killed. The reality is it changes. When, when this takes place, folks, again, it changes the whole chemistry of the earth. It changes the reality of the earth. It is judgment upon the earth. The, the world is now having to respond to the reality of God's judgment here. We have the third judgment, verse 10 and 11. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. It fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. It had been made bitter. And so we see here this, this third trumpet that comes down, the this, this, this salt water, the oceans, the seas, a third of them has been impacted. Now the result is this, a great star falls. Some would say here that this is an angel. We do see, we do see angels being equated with stars here in Revelation, but again, it's context. Context is king. It doesn't appear at all that in this context that this is an angel. It appears that it is, it is a celestial body of some, of some kind. It comes down. Uh, from heaven, it's blazing like a torch. Again, we have that meteor, that comet. We, we got that idea. Okay, it's not hard to see to understand. God is bringing a, a judgment on the earth, and it affects what? This time it affects fresh water. Rivers, the lakes, a third of the fresh water on the earth. They're poisoned. It's called wormwood. God, God calls, this, calls this chemical, it calls the result, it calls it wormwood. It makes all the waters bitter. We saw it in the Old Testament. It was able to be corrected by, by God's hand, the water that was uh, made bitter. But here it's not able to be corrected. It's, it's poisonous. Uh, and so it, it creates death, and many people are going to die. It doesn't tell us how many, but many are, folks, the third of the fresh water on the earth is going to be poisoned. Um, again, that changes the whole earth. It changes everything. If this, is, if this is the area where that takes place, we don't have any fresh water. Wherever you live, where this takes place, there's no fresh water. The grass is burned up. The trees are burned up. Whether it's a result of, of war, whether it's a result of, of God's specific hand, which I believe, it's simply, it's simply the result is the result. And it's, it's terror on the earth. I believe the results in each of these, in, these, in these trumpets are literal. They're specific, and they are at the hands of God. And then we see the fourth trumpet here in this chapter, verse 12. And the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Folks, in some way, he affects, his, he affects the ability of the, of, the, of the lights to shine, the celestial bodies to shine. That's the reality of what we see. A third of the sun, moon, and stars lose a third of their light. Does that mean that like, a third of their light goes off? Or does that mean that it loses a third of its intensity? Probably, most likely third of that intensity and so it changes everything our ability to see and not only that it affects light in a third of each day and a third of each night it grows dark completely dark for a third of the day and a third of the night and, and so it changes it changes everything where a world is in chaos and there is upheaval and there's war and there's people hating each other and one another and sin is present and sin now has more of an opportunity because of the darkness because of the chaos Folks, it won't be safe to live in your neighborhoods. It won't be safe to live where you live. You think, you think now is a challenge. It's going to get infinitely worse in the tribulation. You'll always be looking behind your back. Always be on guard. Always running. Neighborhoods won't be safe. You're going to have the reality of a, of a world that's turned upside down. Chaos that is taking place. And then the celestial bodies are affected. 
and the ability of the light to shine. Does that mean there's an there's an eclipse every day, or somehow it doesn't work? I don't know the I don't know the answers. We can try, but I don't know. It doesn't tell us. It simply tells us that a third of the light each day is going to be affected. A third of its intensity, and then the third of its of its ability to shine. It loses a, a third of its ability to shine, and so it's dark longer. Um, and it just changes. And you have the chaos of all the destruction in these trumpets that's, trumpets that's already taken place. Folks, it's chaos in the world. It's absolutely chaos is the reality. That's what takes place. And then verse 13. And then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. God declares, he proclaims the last three trumpets and he gives a name to each one of them, woe. He says destruction is going to be greater, more significant, more deadly as a result of what's going to happen. Contained within the trumpets will be the seven bowl judgments. It's going to be worse. It's going to get more intense. It's going to get, it's going to get far worse. We see, the, we see the trumpet judgments unfold. God is judging his earth. I want you to know the significance on these, on these initial judgments is on a third, 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 third. You know, what we see here is this. As God is pouring out his judgment on the earth, what else is he doing? What is he doing? He's restraining his hand. He's showing mercy yet upon the earth. He's not bringing destruction upon the whole earth. He's still giving the earth opportunity. He's still giving the earth a chance. That's what he's doing. Revelation chapter 9, verse 20, 21, they didn't repent. But you know what? That's his desire. You know, it's amazing he puts that there. Because what does that say? On the other side of that coin, what does that tell us? God's desire as he's pouring out judgment on the earth is that, is, that, is that people will what? That they will turn to the Lord in faith. That they will repent of their sins. Because see, it's in repentance of sins that they find that loving, eternal relationship with God. Forgiveness of their sin, which is bringing the judgment of God down upon them in the first place. It is mercy. There is grace that God is, is still showing to a world who as a whole refuses. Yet at the same time, there is the greatest revival that has ever happened happening on this earth. People are being saved. Because they're being saved, they're being pursued. The world will hate them with a vengeance. Anyone who is a Christian, they will know that the cause of this judgment is God. And so anyone who takes the name of God, they will hate and they will pursue. If you receive Jesus Christ as Savior, you will be on the run. If you refuse the gift of life in Jesus Christ, you will be judged. There are two realities in our life. We see that here. Romans chapter 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. If my mind is set on doing things my way, being in control of my life, being in charge of my life, refusing God's direction, refusing relationship with God, then I am in hostility with God. I may go to church. I may be spiritual. I may do spiritual things and, and Christian things. But if I don't submit and yield to the things of the Lord, if I don't desire his work in my life, then God says of my life, I am hostile to him because of the flesh, because of the very, my very nature. If the very nature is revealed in this, if I don't submit to the God's word, because of God's because of that sin nature, separated from Him, I cannot. Only by the work of the Spirit can that change. And so, what's revealed here is this: if I stand opposed to the work of God in my life, if I don't submit to the Word of God in my life, then I'm hostile to God. I cannot do what He pleases. I cannot please God here. It says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So all of those who are here on the earth, who have hardened their hearts, they are in hostility to God. They refuse to submit to the word of God and to the, to the revelation of God because of the hardness of their heart, and they cannot please God. That's the reality. And here's what Paul says, though. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. The two realities of life are this. I'm either in relationship with Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God and His work in my life, or I'm in hostility to God because the nature of sin controls me, not the Spirit of God. Those are the only two choices. Those are the only two realities of every man, woman, and child on this earth. We have a need that we can't meet, and Jesus Christ meets that need. He rescues us from these things by the Spirit of God, by faith in Jesus Christ, and, and puts us into relationship with Him. 
Acts chapter 17, verse 31. God has appointed, God has fixed a day at which he will judge the world in righteousness by Christ who he proves it, Jesus does by rising from the dead. God's fixed a day. It's coming. Every man, woman, and child will be judged before God who stands separated by lack of faith, lack of relationship. God will judge. That's happening here, but this isn't the great white throne. This isn't the final judgment. This is simply the judgment that might bring physical death, not the judgment of spiritual death. That hasn't happened yet. But here's the, here's the flip side of the coin. That's so precious in, this, in the book of Revelation. God will save as well. John 5, 24. Truly, true, it's the truth, I say to you. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death into life. That is the promise of God upon your life. If you would but simply receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, yield your life to, to, to God and say, Lord, I confess my sin, I confess my need, I confess that I need you and I need your forgiveness, and Lord, I yield to you that you might wash me, you might forgive me and cleanse me, that you might put your hold upon my life, your character upon my life, and use me now for you. God, that's where I want to be. I want to be in relationship with you. I want to accomplish what you have for my life. God, I need you. I can't do it myself. There's no way to heaven but through Christ. That's the choice he leaves with us. And when we, when we take that step of faith or receive Jesus Christ as Savior, then he promises us we'll never face this kind of spiritual judgment that, that he's promised at the end. There will be believers who have trusted the Lord who will experience the judgment of God on the earth as they live and then are martyred, but they will not, re they will not face the judgment of God against their sin, for that's been covered at the cross. When their life is taken as martyrs, they will stand in the very presence of God, which we've already seen. This is an eternal judgment it's speaking of, and God wants to keep you from that. He's provided, he's provided His Son so that you don't have to be judged. Folks, He's provided grace so you don't have to be judged. He's provided opportunity so that you don't have to be judged. May you receive His gift of life. May you receive His salvation. That's really the call here in Revelation. May God touch your heart as you read this. Are you ready to stand before God? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Have your sins been forgiven? Have they been washed? Have they been cleansed? Are you allowing the mark of Jesus Christ to be stamped on your life? Are you living for Him? That's the call and that's the question. That's the challenge from God's Word, from Revelation to you and I this morning. Let us heed that. Let us respond to Christ. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for visiting. What a delight, what a challenge it is. We'll see you next week.